Okay, everybody, welcome to Church Health's webinar in partnership with the Tennessee Justice Center, addressing hunger with SNAP and WIC during the COVID-19 pandemic. It looks like we have a lot of our participants already logged on to the Zoom webinar. If you are watching on here and you'd like to share this with friends and family later on, please do know that we're currently broadcasting through Facebook Live. It's on the Church Health Facebook page. You will be able to go on later we watch this Facebook Live video, not to mention we will be uploading a, um, a version of this to our website as well, where it will live with the other series of our webinar videos as well. Thank you for coming today. Um, We're going to wait probably well, just one more minute. Um, I'm going to explain some housekeeping rules and then I'm going to turn it over to our other panelists and they're going to give the information that you came for. First of all, if you signed up for this webinar through Zoom, you will receive a follow up email on Monday. Monday, um, we will be sending out a basically like an information download from everything that you're going to learn today. So if you would like a copy of the PowerPoint, please do know that that is going to be coming to you. It will come to the email that you use to sign up. Um, if you don't receive it on Monday, please do check your spam folders. Oftentimes, that is where our church health emails end up. So please do check that. And if you still haven't received it by Tuesday, feel free to reach out to us and we will make sure that you get a copy of it. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that there is a wonderful chat function and a Q or a Q and a function more likely that you can use on this webinar in zoom. If you have a question for the panelists um, for clarification when they're speaking or to follow up on something at the end. So on zoom, please use the Q and a button. Feel free to ask your question. We will make sure that it gets addressed at the end. If there are questions, if you're watching this on Facebook, please do um, comment your questions on our Facebook live video. We will also be watching for those for the end of the webinar as well. Um, my name is Lauren Hales and I am the Faith Community Engagement Coordinator for Church Health. We are so happy to have our friends at the Tennessee Justice Center who have taken the time to put together this PowerPoint for us, this information in this webinar. And I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to them so that they can introduce themselves and we can get going. Excellent. Thank you so much, Lauren. Hi, I'm Signe Anderson. I'm the Director of Nutrition Advocacy with the Tennessee Justice Center. And joining me on today's call uh, is Kelly Klein. She's our WIC and Child Nutrition Advocate and Sarah Henson. Uh, and she, she is our Nutrition Advocate who works on SNAP. Uh, and we wanted to talk today uh, about addressing hunger with SNAP and WIC. Uh, which is always an important topic and always something that we work with, but it, given the current circumstances, the programs have changed a little bit. So uh, it, there will definitely be a focus on SNAP and WIC in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'll start out by giving us, giving you all an overview of the Tennessee Justice Center and the work that we do. Uh, and then I am going to turn you over to the rest of the team to, to share the, the core information. Um, so just a little bit about Tennessee Justice Center. Um, the nutrition team is just part of our work. We also have a healthcare team uh, that focuses on advocacy around making sure Tennesseans are insured and, and have coverage. Um, but we do our anti-hunger work um, and our focus and vision is a hunger-free Tennessee. Uh, our mission is to protect and strengthen the federal nutrition program. So our approach to hunger and poverty is by supporting the federal nutrition programs, uh, SNAP, WIC, and the child nutrition programs. And we do this by improving access to the programs. Uh, we have many outreach efforts uh, to make sure that underserved communities are served with these programs. Uh, we also work to help folks who might have the opportunity to run a program if you work with children uh, and, ch uh, and do child programming. We um, work with program providers to help them serve meals if they're not doing so already. Um, and then we also have uh, part of the work that we do is advocacy. So uh, both on the federal and the state level. Um, so on the federal level, we often look at the farm bill uh, when that comes up for reauthorization. Uh, the nutrition programs, SNAP, are um, 
are part of the farm bill. So that's our advocacy on the federal level. Um, and then on the state level, we are uh, often doing work to protect the nutrition programs, uh, but then also always looking for positive ways to make sure these, these programs are able to reach uh, low income uh, Tennesseans and make sure that people are able to uh, afford food to put on their tables. Um, and then on the education part, uh, I, while these programs are the, the largest anti-hunger support in the state and actually in the United States, um, not a lot of people understand or know as much about food stamps and WIC uh, in the child nutrition programs as, as we would like them to. And so a lot of our work is making sure that people know what SNAP is, what it does, uh, know what WIC is, know what the child nutrition programs are, um, make sure that we clear misconceptions about the programs, and make sure people understand how they work to support an individual, but not just the individual, the, the wider community, uh, because it's really important, uh, not just for, not just <laughs> the fact that um, we're uh, feeding an individual, but uh, the, the overall impact of feeding them uh, helps impact our community uh, at large. Um, and then also providing policy expertise to lawmakers. We, uh, we read about these programs, we know a lot about SNAP and WIC, and so wherever we can provide information to help lawmakers make decisions, um, we, we provide that support as well. Um, and then uh, just leading statewide anti-hunger advocacy efforts. If, if folks on the line or anyone across the state wants to join us in, in these efforts, we are always looking for people to support us in helping to end hunger and make the federal nutrition program stronger and, and work more effectively for people. And then the next slide I think might be, let's see. Okay, so uh, the others, uh, again, I, I mentioned that our focus is uh, looking at WIC and SNAP and how those help support individuals across the state. We also wanna provide the basics of the program, uh, what the basics are even without COVID-19 happening right now. Um, but because there have been some changes to the program, we, we wanted to, make sure that we share that information as well because it's not quite business as usual with with the nutrition programs or anywhere quite frankly these days so uh, we wanted to uh, just talk a little bit about COVID-19 and how that's impacting uh, the nutrition programs so as all folks are aware there are growing numbers of cases of COVID-19 across the state um, schools, actually before we sent this off, um, the schools ended up being closed. Uh, Bill Lee announced, Governor Bill Lee announced last night that schools are actually going to be closed through the rest of the school year. Um, a lot of businesses have closed down. Um, we still have the safer at home orders in place so people aren't going out. Um, and then there's a, a huge amount of job loss across the state. Uh, the unemployment rate at the beginning of March, or the folks filing for unemployment was around 4,000 4, applications, but by the end of March, it had exceeded, uh, I think, 40,000 job applications. So that all has impact on whether or not people across the state are able to afford food to put on the table. Um, and so that has direct impact on our programs. Uh, we know that there were many people that were qualified and needed these programs before, but now in light of what's happening um, on a state level with the economy and schools closing, we know these programs are more important than ever before. Um, and that's what they're meant to do. These, meant, these programs are meant to help in, in times of great need. And, and here we are right now in, in a time of great need. And so it's really important that people know about, about the programs and how to help their community access some of these meals. So we're gonna share the basics of WIC, the basics of SNAP. We're gonna talk a little bit about the child nutrition programs um, and um, make sure that you guys have the information that you need to, to share with individuals that you might work with. Um, so again, I, I think I already touched on this a little bit, you know, the federal nutrition programs are now more critical than ever before. Um, uh, 
and also programs respond to food insecurity, providing meals to families when they need them. Uh, and I think the other point to make here too is this isn't just helping the individual, the money that folks get when they have, when they're on SNAP goes directly back into the, the economy, which is something that we, we really need right now. Um, so uh, we're actually gonna start the presentation with the WIC program, uh, which is this special supplemental nutrition program. Uh, and then um, for women, <laughs> infants and children. And then we're gonna move into, uh, Kelly's gonna talk a little bit about school meals and summer meals, because I think it's important for folks on the line to know uh, a little bit more about what's happening with those right now. Um, and then Sarah Henson's gonna take over and talk about the SNAP program. Uh, and again, please feel free to use the chat box. And, and also we are leaving our contact information at the end of this. And so if there's anything that we can help you all with to reach people in your community with these programs, uh, we, we wanna be helpful. So feel free to reach out to us after the presentation as well. Um, and with that, I will, we can turn it to the next slide and I'm gonna turn it over to Kelly Klein to talk about WIC. Thank you so much, Sydney. Um, so first, I just want to go over the basics of WIC, just to make sure that everybody is on the same page. It is um, a lesser known nutrition program. I know um, Sarah's gonna talk a little bit about SNAP later, and that's definitely the most well-known nutrition program. Um, so with that in mind, I just wanted to go over some of the basics of WIC in case um, people are unclear about who qualifies, what it provides, and um, how to enroll in WIC. So first, when we're talking about WIC eligibility, there's kind of four basic um, requirements that people would need to meet in order to be eligible for the WIC program. The first one is uh, categorical eligibility, and that just means um, what, uh, are, you, are you one, a pregnant or postpartum woman, or are you a child under five? So those are kind of the main two categories that I point people to as people who are eligible for WIC. So pregnant and postpartum women and children under five. Um, I also like to emphasize that these, the, these categories are not women with children under five, it's women and children under five are eligible. So what does that mean? That means that uh, guardians and caregivers um, like foster parents or single dads or grandparents with custody are also able to receive WIC benefits if they have a child under five that meets the, the rest of these eligibility requirements. Um, in terms of custody, the grandparents would need to have uh, legal custody of the children, but there is a possibility for um, if the legal guardian is not the grandparents to be able to deem the grandparent as a proxy and then the grandparent can go with them. But you do need the legal guardian to uh, enroll in that first appointment. Um, the second requirement is the residential requirement. And all that means is that the person receiving the benefits lives in the state that uh, is administering the benefits. So there's relatively relaxed requirements when it comes to what counts as proof. Um, they technically, all they need is a piece of mail with their name and a Tennessee address on it. So you don't necessarily need a utility bill. You don't necessarily need a lease, for example. Um, and the other thing I'll add is that there's no citizenship requirement for WIC. So uh, undocumented families are eligible for the WIC program, which is uh, a different facet of it than a lot of other federal nutrition programs. Um, we've been hearing a lot of feedback that there may be some fear around enrolling in WIC. So one of the things that I think it's important to tell people and especially undocumented families is that WIC does not collect any citizenship uh, information whenever you go into the WIC clinic. Um, so they don't have any of that information on any of their participants. The third eligibility requirement is the income requirement. So what I want to point out here is that the income requirement is much higher than a lot of other um, nutrition programs and other uh, benefit programs. It's 185% of the federal poverty line or less. Um, if you are curious about what that looks like, it changes depending on the size of the household. So the income cap is uh, 
lower for a household of one than it would be for a family of four. Um, then you, I've included here on the right the WIC pre-screening tool that USDA has provided, and um, it's a great tool that you can kind of click through, and it uh, is not, I want to emphasize that it's not enrolling in the WIC program, this website, but if you're curious about if uh, someone that you're meeting with or somebody in your congregation is eligible for WIC, this is a great kind of quick thing to go through to see um, if they might be eligible. But what I usually recommend to people is that even if they have any doubts or they suspect that maybe the pre-screening tool hasn't been quite accurate, is to just go ahead and call your WIC clinic. And I'll include the contact information for WIC in a later slide. Um, but if you have any doubts at all, uh, I, I always recommend that people call WIC um, and ask for more detailed information. The other thing I wanted to include in terms of the income requirement is this adjunctive eligibility part. And all that means is that if someone is enrolled in SNAP or TANF or TENCARE, um, that that counts as, uh, the, as proof of income for that person. So um, we know that individuals who are accessing these programs, it can sometimes be difficult for them to obtain proof of income if it, they don't always receive um, nice, neat check stubs from their employer. Sometimes um, the money is coming from under the table, or sometimes it's put on a debit card or uh, something else of that nature. Um, so what adjunctive eligibility means is that they can provide proof of SNAP benefits, whether that is their letter of their award letter for SNAP benefits or their 10 care card. Um, if they provide proof of that, then that counts as proof of income. And the reason for that is just that the income cap for all those other programs is lower than it is for WIC. So if someone uh, qualifies for those other programs, then that means that they all automatically qualify in terms of this income requirement for WIC. The last one is that in order to qualify for the WIC program, they need to be at some sort of nutritional risk. Um, there are over 400 different items that the WIC nutrition nutritionist can check in order to qualify for this eligibility. So just to give you an example of some of the things that um, would qualify as nutritional risk, uh, not eating enough fruits, not eating enough vegetables, um, not being able to get your recommended daily amount of exercise, smoking, um, a family history of health concerns, a personal history of health concerns. There are so many different options that would qualify someone as nutritional risk that almost every single person I know would qualify under this eligibility. So whenever I'm talking to people who are interested in helping other people apply for WIC, I usually emphasize that the three that really need to be remembered are these first three, the, the categorical pregnant postpartum women and children under five, um, residential, do you live in Tennessee, and then the income level, um, which is 185% of the federal poverty line or less. Um, so I really encourage, we're going to send out the PowerPoint after this, just like Lauren said, so I really encourage you guys to explore this WIC pre-screening tool. It's, uh, it also is provided in Spanish as well, so um, if you guys are curious or want to follow up or you're meeting with someone and you don't quite remember, then you can either give me a call or you can use this great WIC pre-screening tool. So when it comes to what exactly does the WIC program provide? The first thing that it provides is healthy food via an EBT card. So in this sense, it's very similar to SNAP, AKA food stamps, um, in that participants or their caregivers are given an EBT card, which is a, it looks exactly like a debit card and functions like one when you go to the grocery store. Um, and the benefits can be loaded onto it remotely. So they receive funds for food that they can then go to a WIC vendor, vendor and um, purchase that food there. It is uh, a more specific food package that's aimed around promoting development, especially early in life. So that's why it's aimed at children under five and pregnant and postpartum women is because those populations need extra nutrition um, more than your average person. So the, the food package is more specific um, and we have heard that that can be a barrier for people. If you've heard that um, people aren't enrolled, aren't using their WIC benefits because it's too specific. That's something that we would love to know about to help um, kind of address that barrier. So if you have any feedback on what people are experiencing with the WIC program, please get in touch with me and then we can try and help 
um, sort that out and make it easier for participants to um, access food. Uh, but some of the other things that people don't always associate with WIC, um, you can go back there, um, is uh, to the WIC benefit slide, sorry. Sorry. There we go. Um, is these other three components. WIC also offers a lot of breastfeeding support. So not only do they offer um, breastfeeding equipment that sometimes uh, moms may need um, in order to do breastfeeding, but they also offer peer counselors as well. So other women who have gone through similar things and can support them on a more personalized basis, um, they offer that service at most WIC clinics. Um, they also offer nutrition education. So their tagline is that they provide healthy food and they teach you how to make it. Um, and anybody with young children will tell you that just because you put healthy food in front of a child doesn't mean that they're going to eat it. So knowing how to prepare it in um, fun, delicious ways is really important. And that's some of the information that they provide at WIC clinics. Um, they also provide referrals beyond WIC. So uh, WIC can serve as a touch, another touch points for families into other services in the community. So oftentimes people will go into a WIC clinic and the clinician will, will tell me that, um, you know, WIC is the last thing that they talk about because they're talking about all the other needs for the family first, which include healthcare needs, it, it can include um, income uh, solutions, um, anything of that nature they can talk about at the WIC clinic. So it's a great other touch point if you're kind of looking to create that net of uh, social safety, WIC is a really important part of that. Um, so why do we care about WIC? I've already mentioned some of the reasons that um, the WIC program was formed in the first place, but um, what I wanted to emphasize is that numerous studies show that WIC not only helps reduce premature births, reduces low and very low birth weight babies, reduces fetal and infant deaths, um, it reduces the incidence of low iron anemia, it also increases access to prenatal care and just health care in general for women and children um, earlier in pregnancy and earlier in life. Um, but what I also want to call attention to is this last bullet point in the bottom right, which is that WIC also increases the availability of healthy foods in WIC eligible grocery stores. So um, this is especially true for a lot of vendors that may not be your traditional large vendor like Kroger um, or Publix etc. So your corner stores, um, convenience stores, um, places like that that may not otherwise carry fresh fruits and vegetables, but because they know people in the neighborhood have WIC benefits and could buy that, they start stocking fruits and vegetables for the community so that they can accept WIC benefits. Um, and as a result, the entire community has access to healthy foods that they can buy in addition to WIC participants. So WIC is really a community program as well. It increases the health of communities. So like Sydney was mentioning, it's not only a benefit for the individual, but it also benefits um, the communities that it serves as well. Uh, so in terms of how WIC has changed in response to COVID-19, um, I definitely wanted to go over this because normally, um, how WIC is different from SNAP in that most of the time you have to go into a WIC clinic in person for your first appointment uh, and then you receive your benefits on site at the WIC clinic. Um, obviously, as a result of social distancing uh, recommendations, most WIC clinics have uh, shut down for participants and they are doing um, appointments by phone or appointments remotely. So um, WIC is able to do this because the requirements that people come in person has been waived by state and federal agencies. Um, so as of now, WIC is not collecting the things that they normally would in order to check in on people like uh, height, weight, or blood work. Um, and if participants don't already have an EBT card, they are mailing those to people. Um, we also know that uh, folks in many communities are seeing a lot of grocery store shortages and the WIC package is already very specific in the first place. So it's not just any cheese, it's this specific 
um, weight and um, brand of cheese, for example. But if you go to the grocery store and that's sold out because of the pandemic, um, then uh, there's, there's nothing you can do. And so um, WIC has issued food package flexibilities that allow people to purchase other things um, if what they were originally going to buy is sold out. There are a lot of different flexibilities um, and WIC clinics should, uh, are communicating this to participants, but it's really important that we spread the word because people may not know that this has changed if they haven't gone in for an appointment recently. Um, so we'll send um, a link to the food package changes whenever we send out the follow up uh, slides and email, but I just wanted to flag that for people that there are flexibilities and people who use WIC can access other resources. So in terms of how to refer people right now, and again, this looks different when we're not under the pandemic, um, but currently the best way to find your local WIC clinic is to go to signupwic.com, which is an awesome website uh, run by the National WIC Association, and you just type in your zip code. The website's available in Spanish and English, um, and it shows your nearest WIC clinic, their hours, and their phone number and address. Uh, I am emphasizing to people that currently the best way to, to get in contact with them is to call to make an appointment. Um, if there is um, barriers in terms of how to access a phone or how to get in contact with them or providing proof, uh, please let me know. Uh, we uh, are constantly wanting to make sure that we are aware of the barriers that people are running into so that we can address it. Um, on a systemic level so that people don't run into those consistently. Um, I also want to emphasize that if a participant qualifies for WIC, they receive WIC benefits the same day. Um, this can be a little bit delayed now that they are mailing EBT cards. Um, so it depends on if the person already has an EBT card, but uh, they will mail that EBT card the same day. So however long it takes for the mail to deliver that is how long that they would take it would take for them to receive the benefits and be able to begin using it. You can go to the next slide. Um, so I'll uh, reiterate, just like Lauren said, that if you guys have any questions at all about the WIC program or uh, how we support people who are referring people to WIC to go ahead and um, use the Q&A box in order to ask those questions. I'm going to move on to school meals uh, because I know um, that this is a really important issue with schools closed. And the changes for school meals and child nutrition programs are very highly localized as a result of um, school systems operating somewhat independently of each other. Um, one exception to that rule is the Department of Education has put together this website, schoolfoodfinder.com, where you can search on a map in Tennessee places where you can go pick up school meals that are being served. Um, uh, as a result of school closures. So uh, it's a really intuitive website. I highly encourage you guys to go um, use it. In Shelby County, the, the, as I'm sure many of you know, um, schools had to cease serving um, school meals, pick up and to go, because one of their uh, nutrition staff members tested positive for uh, COVID-19. So as a result, the Y and Mid-South Food Bank are collaborating in order to serve meals to kids in response to school closures. Um, so I included the link here, which again will be sent out afterwards that have emergency meal sites. And there's over 20 different meal sites in, in, um, on this list. I didn't count the exact number, um, but I really encourage you guys, if you are talking to a family and they have young children or, um, or uh, the, the mom is pregnant or she has recently given birth to do three things, connect them to WIC and then also go to these two sites to find out where they can, they can access school meals. Um, so WIC is generally for kids who are younger than school age, but if they, if they have a family that has a, a mixed age kids, um, then you can access all of these different services in order to provide the most food for the family. Um, and a lot of these, uh, like the Y and the Mid-South Food Bank, are able to operate uh, through the summer food service program. So 
if any of you are interested in becoming a summer food service program sponsor, um, the one of the things that we emphasize about the summer food service program is that they operate kind of as emergency response um, in terms of nutrition programs. So anytime there's unanticipated school closures, it's SFSP um, host organizations that will respond and provide meals. So it's a great way to build community capacity and to build um, a food safety net that doesn't necessarily rely on schools remaining open um, in situations like this. Okay. <clears throat> And many churches are host sites for this, so it would be a great opportunity for um, community partners. Mm -hmm. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Sarah Henson, who's our nutrition advocate, um, and she'll talk a little bit about SNAP. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, and thanks for giving so much good information about WIC and school meals. Kelly. Um, I'm just going to give a little bit of an intro to SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, kind of in the same way that Kelly did, just in case anyone's new to it or um, doesn't know that much about it. SNAP, formerly called Food Stamps. Um, I'll talk about how to apply, how you can help others apply, changes, of course, during COVID-19, the economic stimulus packages that have gone through the federal Congress, and then opportunities that we have and that you guys can join going forward. So a little bit about SNAP 101. Um, it's SNAP called the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. And like I mentioned, a lot of people um, have called it food stamps for a long time, um, even though it's been called SNAP for about 10 years. So it's just good to mention that so we're all on the same page about what we're talking about. Um, the best thing about SNAP is that it provides money for food insecure people to buy food and put food on, on tables and in fridges right now. Um, but of course, um, it's only about $1.40 per meal on average is what people receive in their SNAP benefits. And so of course that's not enough. Um, with SNAP benefits, people can buy only groceries. Um, we can't buy hot meals or alcohol or diapers or anything like that. So it's just food um, and again, no hot meals. So if you go into a Kroger or something, you're not gonna be able to buy that rotisserie chicken with your SNAP benefits. Um, SNAP benefits are administered in, um, on a card just like WIC. On an, EBD card, on an EBT card, it looks just like a debit card, and they're also being received in the mail. Um, it's administered through the Department of Human Services, and each county has a different DHS office. Um, and so if, if anyone needs uh, to be connected to them, there's a great uh, website link that I'll have and we'll send out there. Um, SNAP is based on income and asset tests, um, and then there's different eligibility requirements. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. Um, so a little bit about SNAP eligibility. If you remember, Kelly talked about um, the income limits for WIC being 185% of the federal poverty line. So it's a little bit more flexible on who can apply for WIC. Um, more people would be eligible. Um, whereas with SNAP, um, the gross income is 130% of the federal poverty line. And then after deductions, the income can only be 100% of the federal poverty line. So it's a little bit more restrictive in who can um, who can actually apply for SNAP and who can be eligible. Um, so to, to be eligible for SNAP, people must meet both of those. Um, and I, I have, for a family of four, the gross income would be a little over $2,000 a month or the net income would be, um, those should actually be switched. But this chart over here um, has a little bit more about that. And if you have, if you would like help kind of helping a family decide if they would be eligible, I have some pre-screening tools, feel free to reach out to us um, and I can send that out as well. Um, a couple of the deductions for SNAP eligibility, um, things that are deducted by caseworkers as people are providing their information. There's a standard deduction of 20% for just costs that families can't avoid. There's an earned income deduction, um, an excess shelter or housing deduction, um, utilities, dependent care, child support and payment. These are all things that a caseworker should ask or that will be asked on the online application. Um, and so just things to be making sure that are, are listed there so that um, that net income and, and the income can be counted correctly. Um, as I mentioned, there's also an asset test. And so um, families can't have more, uh, more than um, 2250 in the bank and that counts cash and checking. It doesn't count things like your home or your car um, so it's really just cash on hand. Um, however, these 
eligibility requirements are different for seniors and any individual who has a disability, that asset test um, moves up to $3,500. SNAP also has categorical eligibility, um, which is somewhat similar to the eligibility for WIC. So if, um, if a household has members that are entirely on um, SSI or on Families First or TANF, um, then they would be categorically eligible for SNAP and there's less information that those families or households would need to provide because DHS can see if they're on that program and then get information from there and kind of streamline the process. There is no minimum state or county residence period. So if somebody had just moved to Shelby County, um, they would be eligible immediately to apply for SNAP. Um, however, a difference from WIC is that to be eligible for SNAP, um, an individual must be a citizen or a refugee or a lawful permanent resident. There are some restrictions for LPRs um, and I'm happy to share more information about that. Um, another really important thing to mention with SNAP, um, and I know with, with the partners on the line, you may be working with seniors or directing them towards SNAP as they, um, or, or anyone with a, a disability, um, in this time, especially as people need help getting food on the table. And so one of the things that's consistently missed or um, sometimes not asked by caseworkers is about medical deductions. Um, and so this is any out of pocket expense for an individual who has disabilities or a senior um, who pays over $35 a month out of pocket. And there's a huge list that we have. We have a really great resource of things that can count for that. Um, it can even count things like gas mileage to your doctor's appointments. Um, in addition to prescriptions and doctor's visits and different things like that. Um, and it, it's really important to mention this because only one in seven households with seniors claim this medical deduction. And so there are a lot of seniors, um, I work with people who apply and, and help people apply for SNAP all the time. And a lot of, a lot of times they say seniors will say um, a couple key things. Um, they'll say, I don't, I don't want to go through the paperwork to only get the minimum amount of 15 or $16. Um, but a lot of times, as we see in this statistic, there's a lot of seniors who aren't claiming their medical deductions, which can greatly increase um, their SNAP benefit and really help that grocery budget as they're going along. So if anyone has questions about how to, how to ask those questions or needs guidance on um, how to um, encourage people to apply for SNAP, um, please reach out. I would definitely love to help that, but it's, it's definitely, um, we know that there are lots of seniors, especially right now, who would benefit from SNAP and it would really help their grocery budget. Um, and so we want to be ensuring that they have the best health possible. Um, and SNAP is one of the best ways to ensure um, nutritious food is on the table for seniors. So this is a great, a great tool to make sure that um, we're sharing with seniors and people with disabilities. Uh, for the SNAP application, in general, it can be, um, you can apply for SNAP online via phone or by faxing in an application that you get um, in person or by downloading it and printing it um, from the website online. Um, and also you typically in, in normal circumstances, you could apply at the county DHS office. However, as all the DHS offices have moved um, to remote working and have their offices closed, um, online and by phone or fax are the best ways. And so I've linked the online application right here. Um, what people will need to do is create an online account, um, which will have an email address and a password. So if you are working with someone um, who might have issues keeping up with that, um, sometimes it, it helps to help them write that down somewhere or if they don't have an email account, um, just knowing that that might be a barrier for people and, and be ready to help people sign up for a Gmail or a Yahoo or something. Um, that's something that that our caseworkers do. Um, and then, of course, by phone or fax, if if online access is an issue for them, um, the county DHS and family assistance offices for the state are all listed here. Um, I know primarily Shelby County is where most of you will be working in and out of. But of course, there are several counties surrounding. So I linked the page um, on the state website that what that has all the county information and it has phone, fax, um, an email address to ask for a verification or to send in other bills, um, has the address and different things like that um, so that you can get in contact with them as best as possible. Because we know that, of course, in this time, as Signe mentioned, lots of people are losing jobs. More people 
um, are becoming eligible for these programs and seeking assistance from them. And so there are, there's a really high increase of applications. And so things are a little bit slower. Um, so if you're like me and you want to make sure <laughs> you can reach someone, there's several different ways to reach out to the county offices there. I did want to highlight some of the SNAP partners that I work with in the Memphis area. Of course, everyone I'm sure is familiar with Mid-South Food Bank. Um, they are a really great partner and are doing lots of really fantastic work, especially right now as so many people are in need of food. I work specifically with Nikila Jones um, and she is the SNAP outreach coordinator. She helps with SNAP application and screenings. And so if you need kind of um, an in-person uh, or, or somebody in your area who might know Memphis issues specifically or who can help take care of this, you can direct questions to her. Um, she's really fantastic, very helpful. Um, so that's her email. And then also I work with the University of Memphis. If any of you are working with college students or parents or, or family members who, um, who are taking college classes, they also are doing some SNAP outreach and they have a pantry as well. They're doing SNAP pre-screening for students. Um, and so I have their website listed here, um, which is the best way to get connected with that. Um, and then I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Memphis Aging Commission. Monique Stewart is the person there who does the SNAP outreach and SNAP application assistance. And because of course so many seniors um, would, would benefit from grocery assistance, especially now, but in always really, um, she would be a really great resource for you to have. And then if you're outside the Memphis area, but still in West Tennessee, maybe closer to Jackson, West Tennessee Legal Services also has some SNAP outreach and Beth Bates leads that there. They have a Facebook page where they update um, some West Tennessee specific SNAP opportunities as well as some, some food resource opportunities and they're sharing that on their Facebook, um, which is just WTLS SNAP. Um, should be easy to find, especially if you're watching this via Facebook right now, but I've linked this here so that you can find it later and see if any of those resources are, are helpful for you. Um, just to cover some of the specific SNAP changes that have happened during COVID-19, as I mentioned, the DHS offices moved to appointments only on March 23rd, and now um, they have they've closed down. Um, staff are still available to answer by phone, although, of course, um, of course, as I mentioned, so many people are calling in to get assistance that the wait time may be 30 minutes to an hour. Um, I would just encourage you to be patient because these programs are really important and are, are very effective at getting food on the table for people. Um, but it does help to know that going in. Um, it's not gonna be a five minute quick call. If it is, that's fantastic. I hope that that is the experience, but especially right now, you may have a wait time. So just um, be, be prepared for that. Um, but of course, applications are available online, and they have been, but um, that's especially important now. Another note to mention with online applications is that um, typically people who apply online will get a call for follow-up information quicker. Um, DHS has, um, has some flexibility to, um, to remove interviews at this time, but they may need to call and verify some additional information. And if you apply online, you will get that call faster. Um, however, make sure that you are looking for that call. Um, it will most likely be an unknown number, um, but just encourage people to answer those calls um, in, in, in the case that it is, um, because it, it might be hard to get back in touch after if, if that call is missed. Um, and so for SNAP outreach, I put that on the last slide, but just wanted to reach out again. There are um, some contacts in the Memphis area that are really great resources. We are, of course, in Nashville, but please reach out to us. We're happy to help or connect you with others. Um, and so those, those people are offering assistance. And areas on aging always do SNAP assistance, um, but those, those others that I mentioned um, are specific to your area. Um, and these changes will remain in effect until COVID-19 is under control. Um, I do want to mention one other thing. Well, a couple other things. Um, so one component of the SNAP program is three month time limits. Um, and so if, if an individual falls into the category of ABOD or ABAWD, able-bodied adult without dependents. So a single adult who, who doesn't have any, any kids, um, as dependents, um, they might, they would be, um, 
they could potentially fall into this category of ABOD. And that means they could only receive SNAP for a total of three months in a three year federally set period, unless they were meeting certain requirements, the main one being work requirements, um, meeting a certain amount of hours um, per week or averaged out over the month. Of course, as we mentioned in this time, it is so hard to find a job and people are losing jobs. And so the Families First Act, or the, the first large bill in Congress um, dealing with coronavirus, lifted this three-month time limit. And this time limit rule um, set by the federal administration was set to go into effect April 1st. And so it lifted it. Um, and so these people falling into the ABOD category, these individuals should not be required to work right now. DHS is granting good cause exemptions to all of these people who would have been cut off. Um, and they had an automated system that would cut these people off after three months. And that has been, um, that has been disabled during this time. Um, so if you're experiencing any issues with that or someone reports that they've been cut from SNAP, please reach out to us because that should not be happening. And we would love to figure out what's going on and help advocate for them. Um, so let's see. Um, a couple other changes that have happened to SNAP during, um, during the coronavirus time is that in Tennessee, SNAP clients, and this includes new people who are recently eligible for SNAP, and recently applying or people who were previously on SNAP before coronavirus will all receive the maximum benefits in April and May. And so this is really, really important. Um, if you think about it, if the minimum amount of SNAP is $16 um, for one person and the maximum amount for one person is $194, that makes a really huge difference in the amount of healthy food that people are able to purchase. Um, especially as people are trying to keep their health up and keep immune systems healthy. This is really crucial. Um, and so that's a really great thing. That will, automatically, um, that will automatically be given to any new recipients and, of course, people who are participants um, prior. Um, and I, I say this because it's a, a really great incentive if you work with seniors or someone else who might be worried about getting the minimum amount. It, um, it's a great incentive for the next two months. Um, especially, and we will be advocating as Tennessee Justice Center for that to extend um, and not be tied to the coronavirus specifically, but tied to the economy because we understand that as even as the coronavirus um, will end, the economy will, will be impacted longer. And so that's just something to note. Um, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, there's flexibi flexibility for quality control interviews. Uh, this waves the in-person interviews um, interviews by phone will have extended deadlines for some of them to maintain program integrity. integrity. Um, and after Signe and I spoke with some DHS um, officials on the phone the other day, what, what they expressed to us was that um, the guidance is for caseworkers to eliminate interviews as much as possible. And one way they said that um, that is that we could help streamline that is by encouraging people to um, apply with as much information on the front end so SNAP could be approved quicker um, rather than having caseworkers need to call and get additional information or documentation. So if you are applying for SNAP and they ask for certain documentations, try and upload that if you can um, or just provide as much of it on the application initially. Um, the newest Newest potential change for SNAP in Tennessee is hot meals. If you'll remember when I talked about what SNAP can buy earlier, um, typically hot meals cannot be purchased, but um, in early April, Tennessee applied for a waiver that would allow Tennesseans on SNAP to purchase hot meals. Um, there is no update on this yet. We're waiting for this to be approved, but they have applied. And this would help um, small businesses and um, grocery stores and different things um, more than more than just the SNAP participants and of course um, just to reiterate one of the greatest things about SNAP is that it immediately stimulates the economy for every one dollar that's administered and given to SNAP participants it stimulates a dollar and seventy to a dollar and eighty cents of economic activity and so it's one of the best ways for us to pump money back into our economy and, and help our communities in this time. Um, so why is SNAP so important right now? <laughs> Perfect transition. Um, social distancing is a challenge for food banks um, and pantry providers, of course, um, because there are, are many people who need it and 
and before coronavirus, there were always large lines at, um, at food distributions and, and mobile pantries and things like that. But of course, with social distancing, that's becoming more difficult. And SNAP would remove, remove that issue and allow people to shop on their own time or at, um, at different times. Um, and of course, have more, more choice over the foods that they're, they're able to get. Um, and additionally, for, for food banks and pantries, um, volunteers are in short supply because we have the stay at home order, of course. Um, and so it's harder to get food to people through that um, right now. Um, and food banks do door to door deliveries, but many of them have shut operations down or slowed them down or have less capacity um, because of some of these rules and because of um, volunteers. Um, and then as, as Kelly mentioned, Memphis schools had to shut down their meal distribution. I'm sure you guys are familiar because a staff member tested positive. And um, this will most likely continue to be a trend in different things. So SNAP really, um, really removes the barrier of needing to rely on large groups of volunteers. It, it sends the money straight to the families and then they can go and purchase themselves and, and reduces that, um, that contact. So um, we just wanted to talk a little, a little bit more about opportunities for action for you now um, as we wrap up. And of course, if anyone has questions, please put them in the Q&A and we're happy to answer. Um, we hope this has been informative. But um, some of the opportunities for you to do next is share this information widely. If this is new information to you or if it isn't, um, please share because there are a lot of people who don't know about these programs or about um, all the benefits of them and how much they will help people in this time um, and help communities to rebound healthily. Um, share about the meal sites. We also have, um, Tennessee Justice Center has a COVID-19 website where we are collecting resources and um, have uh, just a bunch of different information and updates on COVID-19 in relation to nutrition programs, food access, and of course, primarily Tennessee Justice Center works on healthcare. Um, and so we have lots of information about that. And then we also have social media accounts. So we have Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Um, we post lots of updates on there. Um, so if you want the, the work to be made easy for you and how to keep up with some important things like this, feel free to follow us, um, Tennessee Justice Center. And if you know anyone who's struggling to access food, um, encourage them to apply for SNAP or WIC, or if you yourself are struggling or maybe someone in your family has lost a job unexpectedly, know that these programs are in place to help in a time of need um, and that these programs um, are very beneficial and, and really help um, people get back on their feet. If you have any questions, as I've mentioned throughout, please contact us for guidance. Um, we love to help. We love to get people connected to these programs because we believe in them and know how helpful they are. Um, and, and lastly, one of the best opportunities for action right now is for you to call your, um, your legislators and especially your senators in Congress at this number or email them um, to urge them that the next coronavirus bill and economic recovery package must build SNAP's economic, economic stimulus effects. A couple of the things that we're advocating for are a 15% increase to SNAP maximum benefits. If you'll remember, on average, um, the cost or the, the amount that's given in SNAP for a meal is $1.40. And so a 15% increase to the maximum SNAP benefits would really help, um, would really help <clears throat> to increase the number of, or the amount of healthy food that families can purchase with SNAP. Um, and of course, to suspend some SNAP administrative rules that would weaken or terminate benefits. Um, we, we want people to be successful in this time. We want people to be supported in this time and SNAP is one of the best ways to do that. Um, and there are several administrative rules from, from 2019 that would weaken or terminate and make it harder for people to get on. And so we're advocating for those um, to be suspended. The first one that has been suspended, of course, as I mentioned, was the time limit rule, but there are some others that could go into effect. And so we will be, um, following those closely and we'll be sharing information about that. Uh, lastly, I did want to mention that um, another way to, to, to stay informed um, is that we have a newsletter. And if you sign up for that newsletter, and I believe we could put it in the chat, Kelly or Signe, if one of you could put it in the, the chat box to everyone, um, that we, we send out alerts. We have, it's just once a month and we have just some like a, a highlight reel of the most important things that are going on and how to stay informed. Um, 
And so those are some really great ways to stay informed about food security and food access, especially in this time, um, and just getting food to our neighbors. Um, so I did want to mention that. Um, and of course, if anyone has questions or comments, um, we would love to answer them. And I don't know if they've been collecting um, somewhere else and, and someone can read them to us. But, but um, again, I'm Sarah and I work specifically with SNAP. Um, and thank you so much for letting our team share this information with you today. Yes, um, I think if you guys have time, um, we're getting very close to noon, but I'd love to do just a couple of quick questions that have come in. Um, first of all, this one I think came from Facebook, um, and anyone feel free to answer whoever is the most um, up to date on this, but there is a social media um, rumor kind of circulating that people should not shop on the first three days of the month in order to benefit people who have WIC or SNAP benefits. Um, is there truth to that? Do you guys have any, can you comment on that please? So this is Signe, and one thing I would say to that is in, in Tennessee, it's not always on the first of the month when uh, families get their benefits. So I think the most important thing to, to be on the lookout for is if you see something that's a labeled WIC product um, and it's running low on the shelves, avoid it. <laughs> um, but because benefits are staggered, um, it's not always a guarantee that it's the first of the month. Wonderful. And then um, another question that came through is when you were talking about, I want to say WIC or one of the two, Wicker Snap earlier, what does it mean by excess shelter? Um, I can answer that. Um, that is with the um with the snap policy they sometimes use um just different different terminology that can, that can be kind of confusing um so basically that just means um different costs related to housing um and i i'm happy if you can send me the information for whoever asked that question i'm happy to send out or i can i can include the the best answer to this in our follow-up email what would count for that so that i can have it directly from the snap policy yeah, that sounds great. Okay, um, the next question is, are the eligibility requirements for these programs the same in Arkansas and Mississippi, or do you have information on where to find those? Because as you know, Memphis is very much geographically, you know, very close to Arkansas, very close to Mississippi. Yes, eligibility is the same for, for SNAP and WIC. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, and last question I think that we're going to have is, what is there, um, as you know, grocery stores and just our kind of like larger food map is changing with the loss of transportation. Um, are there efforts on state, federal, local levels to include SNAP and WIC benefits and connect them more closely with local producers, local farmers? I know since farmers markets are not opening, that might be a little different because local places used to be able to do programs like Double Greens through Wholesome Wave or or whatever it might be. Can y'all speak to that at all and what that might look like moving forward? So I, I, I mean, one of the ways that, or, or one of the proposals and some states have actually moved on this is um, SNAP, SNAP uh, recipients being able to use their benefits online. Um, you know, I think that could help local grocers and and, you know, any, any producer that might be uh, providing to that grocer, um, you know, would benefit from that. Um, I, you know, as far as farmers markets are concerned, I, I think we'd have to do a little more digging into how that's being operated. I know some of the farmers markets are able to, to do a pickup, um, and I'm not sure how that's changing right now, but they should still be able to use if if that farmer's market took um snap bucks or you know the 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 ebt um platform in the past i think they should still be able to do that but we can dig into that question a little more oh yeah no that's wonderful um those are all of the questions that have come in and during the webinar so thank you guys again i think we're going to go ahead and pull up our church health um PowerPoint right now, just so we can have that circulating for people who want to follow up and rewatch this webinar. Um, you can mention one other thing really quickly. Oh, please do. 
Yeah, I just, we thought of one other thing, um, especially for the people who are joining this webinar. One of the best ways that you could share this information, as I mentioned, is to, um, if you're doing live streaming of your services, or if you have a, a COVID-19 webpage for resources, please include the, um, the online application websites that we talked about for Snap and WIC and mention those as resources. Um, that is something that I've seen uh, missed on a lot of pages, but of course it's so important. Um, and so just mentioning it from the pulpit or wherever you're streaming your service. Um, and if you have any resources or potentially a newsletter or a church social media, um, those would be great ways. And if you want anything, we are creating a social media toolkit. Um, and I'm also happy to help um, with some of the messaging for that. And, and this is Sarah again speaking. So if you need assistance with that to make that easier for you, we would love for you to include that um, and are here to help. Okay, wonderful. Um, is there anything else anyone would like to add before we sign off? No, I think so. Um, thank you guys again. Like I said, just reminders for everybody on this webinar, anybody watching through Facebook. Um, if you've signed up for the webinar, please do know that you're going to receive an email with all this information, follow up um, with everything that they've said on Monday. If you are watching through Facebook Live, feel free to you know, copy down their contact information was displayed for a long time. Feel free to pause there, copy it down. Please reach out to them with questions, concerns. Um, feel free to support their work out of Nashville and just know that we are all um, working together to help get food into the people, into the hands of the people who need it. So please um, follow Church Health on Facebook. Go to churchhealth.org, Tennessee Justice Center. Um, for updates, for more information, and also our Facebook group. If you're clergy in Memphis and would like to join, is um, clergy COVID 19 is the short URL, but there is a link in.